Okay, so my name is Chris Harris and I'm a neonatal consultant at King's College Hospital um, and I am uh, hopefully going to talk to you about neonatal ventilation as part of the London School of Paediatrics um, teaching programme. Um, just before we get started, if everyone um, can mute their microphones, that's great. I've um, muted everyone's microphone that I can, but if uh, you, your friends are joining, can you just remind them? Um, to mute as they join. Um, I will try and answer questions that come via the uh, text function as we go through, um, but some of the questions I'll leave to the end um, rather than break up the talk. And I have started recording um, the session as well, um, so uh, hopefully it will be available through the YouTube link. Um, what I'd like to talk about is um, an overview of conventional ventilation, uh, talk a little bit about volume versus pressure control and some of the triggering modes that are available on ventilators and also talk about high frequency uh, ventilation and then end with some example cases uh, with uh, some blood gases and patients and, and explain what I would do um, in those settings um, as a brief aid. So to start with, um, uh, ventilation itself is, is a relatively new um, concept. Um, if you think that uh, the, in terms of common practice, we've only started using the ventilators on, on babies um, since the 70s. Um, we actually managed to send people into space a lot earlier than that. And um, I think that uh, the leaps that we've made in neonatal ventilation after, uh, over the last 50 years have, have been quite, um, quite dramatic. But also um, what we've learned is that by ventilating our premature infants, we, we cause damage. Um, and there's nothing really that we have done um, over the many years that's substantially reduced that damage. So if we cause damage by ventilating babies, why do we do it? Well, um, our main aim is to achieve oxygenation and achieve carbon dioxide clearance. And that allows us to maintain acid homeostasis within the body. Um, we do it for a number of reasons, um, for example, in respiratory arrest uh, for sick babies whose um, respiration is inadequate um, and for premature babies whose poorly compliant lungs um, mean that they are not able to um, overcome that poor compliance with their, their smaller muscle mass um, and other conditions like meconium aspiration and congenital defects. Um, by uh, ventilating babies, we're also able to help them conserve um, energy. Uh, breathing is a, uh, an energy uh, dependent process um, and if they're working really hard with massive recessions then that's energy that won't be used um, to gain weight and also we can use it in, um, uh, in cases where we can see that babies are becoming exhausted and rather than wait for them to rest we can augment their, their respiration and, and help them to have a better outcome. And before we go into the different types of ventilation, um, I thought I'd uh, just start with some very basic definitions. Um, so we can either ventilate um, infants using physiological or conventional ventilation, um, which mimics what the body does, which is essentially breathing, breath in, breath out. Um, or we can use non-physiological um, respiratory support, and that's essentially your high frequency oscillation, which achieves gas exchange without replicating the act of breathing per se. So let's look at conventional ventilation first. So physiologically, um, as human beings, we have a diaphragm and we use our diaphragm to take a breath in because as our diaphragm contracts, it generates negative pressure within our lungs, which pulls air into the lungs. When, our, uh, when we want to breathe out, our diaphragm relaxes and that means that air is pushed out of our lungs by the elastic recoil of those lungs. Um, and this is controlled centrally with, um, uh, with our brainstem. Um, and our brainstem reacts to changes in carbon dioxide and oxygenation, um, and that helps us to breathe faster or slower, um, depending on, on our body's needs. And when we look at mechanical um, ventilation, we apply a pressure to the lungs to drive air into those lungs during inspiration. Um, but when um, we want babies to expire, we still rely on the elastic recoil of those lungs. Um, and also when we're looking at how fast or how much um, uh, respiratory support to, to give, it's very much an external control. 
in most cases, and that means that we have to do investigations and blood gases um, to see. But two of the most important differences um, that separate what happens uh, between when we take over a baby's breathing and when they're breathing by themselves um, are that firstly, there are huge anatomical differences. The um, difference uh, in or the, the complexity of the anatomy of the nasopharynx, oropharynx and um, larynx um, mean that uh, when we put an endotracheal tube in, we essentially bypass all of this anatomy, which um, is there to help uh, maintain the pressures, the functional residual capacity and the residual volume in the lungs and stop lungs collapsing down to zero. And so we have to um, add things to what we do when we're ventilating babies to take, in, in, take that into, into account. Um, but also, and probably most importantly, um, we have babies attached to the end of our ventilators. And whilst all of us can be uh, probably guilty of wandering around the neonatal unit with little white sheets with numbers printed on it and making changes in the ventilators and walking away, um, we should never lose sight of the fact that at the end of our ventilator, there's a baby. And if our baby is not agreeing with what we're doing, then all the changes and all the fancy ventilation modes in all the world won't make any difference and our baby will, will potentially do himself um, a lot of harm. So what um, do these physiological, um, uh, physiological facts mean when we're ventilating babies? Well, I'm going to take you to probably the most important graph um, in ventilation. And once um, you understand this graph, then it makes the changes that you're making to the ventilators seem a little bit more science-based and a little bit less go up by two and down by two with the pressures and change the rate by five, um, depending on the numbers of the graph. So this is a volume and pressure um, graph. Um, and you can see that this is um, what would happen if we started at zero. And if we started at zero, you would need a lot of pressure to have a, um, only a small change in the volume of the lungs. And this is because um, we have to prise open those collapsed alveoli, um, which requires a lot of pressure. And this does essentially a lot of damage if, if we allow um, babies to get to this point. And then after we've slightly expanded those um, alveoli, um, we can then apply um, a linear uh, pressure, which results in a, a much larger change in volume. And this is the ideal portion um, through which to ventilate. Now, if we were to continue to apply a pressure to the lungs, you would see that again, by adding a pressure, uh, a lot of pressure to the lungs at the top of this graph, you get a very um, uh, modest or a very low increase in volume as a result. And this is where our lungs are becoming over, um, over expanded. Um, and again, we start um, to cause damage. And I'll put in expiration just to show you that it's a much simpler process. And um, the changes in the volumes are, are um, uh, much more simple and also less dependent on what we can do um, with our ventilators. So when we are setting up a ventilator, the first thing we need to think about is the positive end expiratory pressure. And this is the constant distending pressure that we add at the end of expiration um, to our babies. And essentially we try and stop them from falling into that zone of atelectasis at the bottom, that zone of collapse. Um, which we know can lead to damage of the lungs. Um, and in, when we look at this um, uh, physiologically, babies have this residual volume or the functional residual volume, depending on, um, uh, on, on where they are in, in their um, inspiratory and expiratory curves. Um, and what we do is we apply a PEEP um, or a positive end expiratory pressure in order to help babies uh, uh, remain at their FRC. And what's the right level of PEEP to apply? Well, the modern evidence um, shows that we don't really have any evidence. Um, and all of the numbers that we tend to use in, in practice um, is that uh, it is taken from the pre-surfactant era, um, which suggests that the ideal PEEPs would be between four and five with six being too much and three being too low in, in most of those studies. Um, however, most of our babies now are um, given surfactant uh, if they're um, preterm particularly, um, and this um, means that their lungs might um, be more uh, compliant and more forgiving of, of differing peat levels, um, but also uh, 
we don't really know what effect the volume control ventilation settings that we mostly use now um, have on our peak levels. Um, so what do we do in practice? Well, most would initially set a peak um, of between four and five centimetres of water, um, and that is consensus um, rather than evidence-based. So after we set our um, end expiratory pressure, um, we then need to think about the pressure or the volume that we're going to use um, to distend the lungs. And before we think about that, we have to look at what actually causes damage um, to the lungs during ventilation. And there has been um, many arguments over the years about whether it's um, volume or pressure. Um, and it's very clear now from animal evidence, which I haven't shown here, um, but also from, um, from infant evidence as well, that over distension, not barotrauma, um, is the main cause of damage to lungs in infants, particularly those born prematurely. So you can put whatever pressures you like into the lungs and it doesn't seem to cause any effect. Um, however, um, the minute your um, tidal volumes go above this magic seven mils per kilo, you tend to get um, quite a large amount of inflammatory reaction in the lungs themselves. But you also have to think about under distension as well, because research has also shown that if you apply um, too little tidal volume, um, then you can end up with the same amount of damage as if you over distend the lungs. So this, there seems to be this magic number between five and seven, um, which tends to be um, the, the levels that we, we aim for. Um, and why do we use volume um, rather than pressure? Well, um, the Cochrane reviews that uh, were done by Peng et al., which as I, I noticed this morning has recently been updated as well, um, showed that when they compared volume targeted versus pressure control ventilation, there were benefits to babies who are volume controlled, which included lower incidence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, fewer ventilation days, and fewer severe uh, intraventricular hemorrhages. And um, they were also able to show that um, these, these lower rates of IVH were likely due to the fact that when babies are on volume control, um, they tend to have fewer swings in their CO2 clearance. And I'll explain that a little bit um, in the future. Um, importantly, um, there was no reduction in death. And there's been lots of criticism about these Cochrane reviews and some of the studies that they've included. Um, and in, in truth, this is a whole discussion by itself. Um, and so there are units that still use pressure control. And, and I would say that that's probably not wrong. Um, but the, uh, the idea of, of monitoring tidal volumes is, is very important. So when we go back to our most important graph, what we're doing is um, we are um, aiming to ventilate babies within that um, red arrow that I've drawn on this graph. Um, and to do that, um, we generate a tidal volume um, and we use a peak inspired pressure um, in order to do that. Um, now we don't have to fill the whole of that tidal volume. Um, the tidal volume um, can be lower than the maximum tidal volume the lungs uh, might achieve before they go into over distension. Um, uh, but somewhere on that red arrow is where you want to be, being mindful of the fact that if you under distend the lungs, you are also doing damage. So what does this look like on a ventilator? And um, what I've done is um, drawn out um, some, some ventilator displays, um, but kept it as simple as possible so that um, hopefully uh, it becomes clear um, what I'm trying to explain here. So what I've done first of all is put pressure in green and volume in blue um, underneath it. Um, and I've drawn an example of what happens during pressure limited ventilation. So you can see that we set an inspiratory time, we set a PIP, we set a PEEP, um, and we set a rate, and the ventilator delivers um, those uh, settings um, regularly um, uh, across a minute. Um, um, yet when we um, look at what's happening to the tidal volumes, you can see that breath by breath, there's a big variation in the tidal volumes. And that's related to changes in compliance. So if the baby has a cough, if the baby takes a breath in in synchrony with your ventilator in one breath, but not the others, if there's a bit of secretion in the tubes, then the volumes might change um, with each breath. Um, and some of those volumes will be within our physiological range, but some of them might be well without uh, uh, or at, well outside the physiological range um, and cause some damage. 
when we use volume guaranteed ventilation, we set a target volume, um, which I've demonstrated here with the yellow line. Um, and as um, our, our baby um, agrees or disagrees or has secretions, um, our ventilator makes adjustments um, to the pressure that it delivers in order to hit our set tidal volume. And then once it hits that set tidal volume, then um, it will adjust the pressure breath by breath um, in order to um, achieve that tidal volume. Now, um, what I would say is that um, volume guarantee and volume target is very different from volume limit. So when we use volume guarantee and volume target, um, what we're doing is we're measuring the expiratory tidal volume because it's the most accurate way to gauge how much air has actually gone into the lungs. And the, uh, it's the, the pressure of the next breath that's adjusted rather than um, in volume limit where the inspiratory volume is limited um, uh, so that you can't go above seven mils per kilo. Um, and there's uh, again another discussion about um, all of these different modes um, but the bottom line is, is that when you use a volume limit um, there's a high risk of alveolar hypoventilation because of the inaccuracies of the inspiratory tidal volume and so we tend to use volume guarantee or volume target rather than volume limit. So what do you do if you work in a unit um, that uh, uses pressure controlled uh, ventilation rather than volume control? Well, um, most ventilators, even um, when you're using pressure control, also have a flow sensor. And it's the flow sensor that allows us to measure the tidal volume um, that a baby is breathing. Um, and uh, most people, even in pressure controlled units, um, would use the tidal volumes that they measure in order to gauge what peak inspired pressure um, to deliver uh, to their babies. Um, and as a rough guide, um, whereas we've said we're aiming for a volume of between five to seven mils per kilo, um, pressures that correspond to that might be um, 20 to 25 in a preterm infant, 25 to 30 in a term infant. Um, but be very aware that um, when you set these settings, um, large changes in compliance, for example, when you've given surfactant, might lead to very uh, rapid changes in the tidal volumes that you're delivering and then you might very well end up with a, um, a CO2 of one um, and lots of angry consultants and parents uh, wandering around the unit as well. And with that in mind, uh, babies who are on pressure control um, tend to need more regular gases to ensure that we're um, giving the right ventilation um, to our babies. So we've set our PEEP, we've set our PIP or our tidal volume. And the next important thing um, to consider is synchrony. And synchrony um, is primarily um, uh, dictated by your rate and inspiratory time. And I'll explain why. So it goes beyond the mechanics of ventilators and beyond the mathematics of what happens underneath those ventilation curves. Um, and rate and inspiratory time can be augmented um, with sedation and paralysis um, and also made more difficult um, depending on your patient's condition, um, particularly if um, you've got a baby with impairment of the respiratory center. Um, for example, babies with sepsis, if they're trying to breathe at a rate of 80, um, then uh, your ventilator settings might need to be adjusted or, or might need more um, sedation in, in order to make and the baby synchronous with your ventilator. And then if you remember that picture at the beginning of the screaming baby, um, actually if you have a screaming baby on the end of your ventilator, I mean, number one, you might want to think about extubating it, but also um, there are many conditions that we can't extubate babies in. And if your baby is shouting at you on the end of your ventilator, um, then whatever the settings that you're, you're trying to input into your ventilator aren't likely to be delivered effectively. And you can do more damage um, as a result as you try and uh, correct an acidotic gas by giving more support to a baby who's shouting at you, at you more. So what does this mean in practice? There is a lot of evidence to show that shorter inspiratory times and faster rates lead to better synchrony in babies particularly those who aren't sedated. So in the days before we use morphine, before we use pancuronium, it was very clearly shown that if you breathed at a rate over um, a normal physiological rate for a baby, babies were more compliant with that rate, and also they had fewer pneumothoraces and lower incidence of death. 
Now, death is probably the most important outcome on any neonatal unit, and there's very few trials that have shown um, a benefit to death in neonatology, but shorter eye times are one of those trials. And so shorter eye times, i.e. below um, 0.5 seconds specifically, but probably around the 0.36 to 0.4 seconds, which um, corresponds to uh, physiological um, inspiratory times, um, tend to be better. And rates of 60 and above tend to lead to better synchronization. And again, um, showed a reduction in air leak and pneumothorax in babies. Admittedly, this was all in the pre surfactin era, um, but I think it's very important, particularly when you're doing things like transferring sick babies from labor ward to NICU using um, a transport incubator, for example, um, where there's no triggering um, involved. If you're on a modern ventilator with a triggered mode, um, most of the evidence suggests that we should be aiming for a backup rate below the physiological range. So if you think that most babies breathe between 40 and 60, if you have the backup rate um, below 40, you improve synchronization um, and uh, your baby will tend to be less angry with you and you need uh, lower settings in order to adequately ventilate them. If you're um, heavily sedated or paralyzed, you have more wiggle room with your inspiratory times. And um, whilst shorter inspiratory times are better for awake babies, longer inspiratory times do improve your oxygenation um, and, in, and indeed lung recruitment. And so if you are thinking that you need to um, have a longer inspiratory time, remember to sedate uh, your infant appropriately and paralyze them if necessary. And in general, um, uh, in general, the bigger your baby, um, the less likely you are to get away with um, without sedation. Um, and they'll need more sedation even for the simplest ventilation. So we've talked about the settings um, that we want to plug into our ventilator. Um, but now um, you have to decide which mode you're going to use. Um, whether it's going to be triggered or not triggered. Um, and uh, I guess the question is, is, is why, why trigger at all? And um, what, we've, uh, what we've looked at over the, over the past is um, comparing triggered modes versus, um, uh, versus non-triggered modes. Um, and what we've been able to show is that um, if you have triggered modes of ventilation, um, you tend to have lower air leak. Um, you also have a shorter duration of ventilation um, in total, but there's no difference in um, either death or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And so we're not necessarily protecting the lungs as such um, when we're using these triggered modes of ventilation, but we are able to get babies off a ventilator faster. And most people would agree that that's a, a better idea. There was a trend towards higher mortality um, with triggered ventilation. Um, but uh, I think we weren't able to explain that scientifically and, and we're not sure why that might be the case. Um, interestingly enough, um, with HFOV, they were also um, more likely to have better outcomes. And this just highlights that um, faster rates um, are, are uh, more inducive of synchrony than slower rates. So in HFOV, we breathe at 600 breaths per minute and that led to better synchronization um, with these infants. So I've put this um, very busy slide um, uh, up, uh, mainly because I am a, aware that this will be recorded and people can come back to this um, as, they, as they need to. Um, and this might uh, be a useful um, cheat sheet, if you like, just to remind yourselves of the differences between um, the various uh, types of ventilation. And what I'd like to talk to you about first is the um, physiological or conventional modes of ventilation. Um, and what I'm going to focus on is the two main types of ventilation that we see in neonatal units, which are PTV and SIMV. The difference, the main difference between these two, two modes of ventilation is that your PTV, AC, PCAC or SIPPV, depending on what ventilator you're using, these modes of ventilation um, trigger a, a ventilator cycle every time the baby takes a breath in. And this is different from SIMV, where um, only the number of breaths that we decide will be supported in a synchronized fashion. And so if a baby um, breathes at a rate of 60 and we set the backup rate at 40 on PTV, then it means that all 60 of those breaths will be supported. Whereas in SIMV, if we set the rate at 40 and a baby is breathing at 60, 
only 40 of those breaths um, will be supported. What I also just briefly touch on at the end is PSV, because I'm aware that some uh, units in London use PSV, um, but I, it's going to be a very brief um, talk about, uh, about this mode of ventilation, because again, this takes a whole um, topic to discuss the ins and outs of PSV. But essentially, PSV, which can be used with either um, SIMV or, or PTV, is a mode of ventilation where um, the baby also decides um, when to expire. So uh, whereas the whole uh, ventilator cycle is delivered with PTV or SIMV and with PSV, if a baby breathes out in the middle of a ventilator cycle, then the ventilator cycle will be stopped um, at that point. So what does this look like on our ventilator? Um, well, I've again, um, I've taken away the volume this time um, and just put the pressure curves up and um, just to make it a little bit more simple um, to what we're looking um, at. Um, and you can see that for non-triggered ventilation, we set an inspiratory time, we set a rate, we set a pip and we set a peep. And that um, uh, those numbers uh, dictate the tidal volumes that we deliver. Um, and if a baby breathes, it doesn't matter what the baby is doing, um, the ventilator will just plug away um, at those same settings uh, and it won't make any attempt to synchronize uh, what it's doing with what the baby's doing. Um, and so there's no synchronization and essentially a very angry baby um, on the end of your ventilator. If we went, were then to add um, our PTV, AC, PCAC, SI, PPV, um, you can see that um, the ventilator cycles stay the same, um, but they are synchronized to when the baby takes a breath in. And if we set our backup rate at 40 and the baby is breathing at 60, it will add in more cycles to make sure that each time the baby breathes in, there will be a ventilator cycle added. Baby um, feels supported, um, the confetti falls from the sky, everyone is happy and um, you can turn down your sedation. When we look at SIMV, um, what happens is that um, the, only the number of breaths that we decide to support are supported. And that means that the baby, whilst it is getting synchronized um, ventilation, there are a number of breaths that the baby is taking um, that, that aren't supported. And next time, uh, well, when lockdown finishes and everyone can go to cafes and, and pubs, um, ask them for a straw and try and breathe through a straw, because remember that we are bypassing all that normal anatomy and see how many breaths that you can take through a straw um, before you get a headache and, and be uncomfortable. Um, and this is why SIMV tends to not be so good um, for premature babies. And actually those Cochrane reviews looking at um, SIMV and PTV seem to suggest that babies on SIMV are ventilated for longer and they grow less well probably because of these unsupported breaths and the energy that they are expending and trying to breathe through that straw um, that's going straight into their lungs. I said I'd mention um, PSV um, and you can see that um, again uh, the, um, the breaths are, are synchronized um, uh, with what the baby is doing. Um, the first breath here is a backup breath, so the baby hasn't taken a, a breath, but the ventilator's delivered one, and it's delivered our normal cycle with the same inspiratory time. Um, but in these subsequent breaths, which are triggered, the baby has breathed out at different points in the cycle, um, which uh, means that um, the ventilator cycle is, is terminated at, at that point. Now, there are, uh, depending on which ventilator you're using, um, you either support uh, infant-driven breaths um, at 100%, or you can um, select a, a different um, a different uh, level to support these breaths at. Um, and this is an example of PSV with 50% pressure support. So the backup breath is delivered as usual, um, but when a baby triggers a breath, the support that's delivered to the baby is is half of what it would be delivered um, in an untriggered breath. So making adjustments, we set up our ventilator, we've got our baby um, on it and someone's handed us a gas and the gas is terrible and we're now all wetting ourselves because um, we now need to do something about it. What are we going to do? Well, actually it's, it's really simple and it's really simple because there are two main numbers that you, you need to think about. Um, the first one is the mean airway pressure. And the mean airway pressure is the average pressure across a minute 
um, that the baby receives. Um, and this essentially uh, is equal to oxygenation. And on a conventional ventilator, um, I've drawn roughly um, where the mean airway pressure would be um, for, for this kind of um, for these kind of pressures. And you can see it's normally about a third of the way down your, your peak inspired pressure um, curve, depending on the rate that your, your baby is breathing as well. But changes in your mean airway pressure will change your oxygenation. As you increase your mean airway pressure, your oxygenation will improve. The second number that you need to think about is your minute ventilation. And your minute ventilation is the volume that you exhale in one minute. And this is equal to your carbon dioxide clearance. And carbon dioxide uh, clearance um, is very important, um, but also um, changes to your minute ventilation will change your carbon dioxide clearance. So more minute ventilation will improve your carbon dioxide clearance less minute ventilation will reduce your carbon dioxide clearance. And so that brings us on to our second most important graph. Um, and it's really one of only two graphs that you need to remember and you can work out most other things around ventilation if you just remember these um, two graphs. And um, because you can see that uh, once you've worked out minute ventilation and mean airway pressure, you can make changes to the oxygenation and carbon dioxide um, quite simply. But the first thing to do is to look at your baby. Um, because there's always a baby at the end of your blood gas and that baby might have a displaced tube or a disconnected tube, they might have an obstructed tube, they might have a pneumothorax, the ventilator might be malfunctioning or your baby might just be going crazy in the incubator and not agreeing to any of the settings that you set. Um, and you need to fix each of those issues first before you start thinking about making changes um, to the ventilator settings. So when we look at improving oxygenation, I've listed these things that you can do to improve um, your oxygenation, um, but all of these changes increase your mean airway pressure. And I've listed them in the order in which they have the most effect. So PEEP has the most effect on mean airway pressure, increasing the rate, um, uh, small, uh, small differences between those last three, um, in all honesty. Um, Improving your oxygenation. So the first thing you can do is increase the PEEP. And the reason why that is the most effective is because we spend more time in expiration than we do in inspiration. So changes to your PEEP will change your mean airway pressure the most. The second thing we could do is increase the PIP or increase the tidal volume. And by increasing the tidal volume, you're essentially asking the ventilator to give the baby more pressure and um, to achieve that volume. And um, we can also increase the inspiratory time. Um, and that will again increase our mean airway pressure. We can also increase the rate. Now, you're gonna to have to trust me a little bit on this, but mathematically, um, in the rates that we normally use for neonatal ventilation, which are between 40 and 60, you get more benefit if you increase the peak inspired pressure or tidal volume than you would by um, changing your rate by, by five, for, uh, for example. So when we look at increasing carbon dioxide clearance, it's a little bit more complicated because you have to work out whether you're on pressure control or volume control. And there are some things that work for both, um, but if you are on pressure control vent or if you're on volume control ventilation, the bottom three, um, uh, three things, the PIP, the PEEP, um, and the inspiratory time won't change your minute uh, ventilation. Um, and in fact, could make things worse uh, from a mechanical point of view. So just beware. So when we look at that on our ventilator graphics, um, we can increase the rate by putting more boxes in. Um, we could increase the tidal volume again, because that would give us more minute volume. If we're on pressure control um, ventilation, we can decrease the PEEP, because that would give us more minute ventilation as well. And, and I circled that um, in, in the box there. Um, and again, if we're on pressure control ventilation, and we can increase the inspiratory time, uh, which would also um, give us more minute ventilation. The things to remember when you're making these changes is that you can't just adjust the mean airway pressure or minute volume um, because changes to either of those things um, will have an effect on the other. Um, and so you have to uh, check, and most modern ventilators will give you both of these numbers, the mean airway pressure and the minute volume, and you can see what your changes make on um, both the thing that you're trying to change and also the thing um, that, that's having the knock-on effect. 
Um, but you also have to make sure your baby is synchronous with what you're doing and also make sure that everything else like your tube, your, your um, uh, equipment and everything is, is up to scratch. And, and basically at the end of the day, remember that there is a baby um, at the end of your blood gas. So now we've looked at conventional ventilation, let's have a look at high frequency. And, and once we understand that mean airway pressure and minute volume um, decide our oxygenation in CO2, actually high frequency becomes much simpler and, and much less scary. Um, in basic principles, we're trying to apply a constant distending pressure to the alveoli. We're trying to use smaller tidal volumes to prevent damage to the lungs. And we're compensating for these small volumes by having a rate much higher than we would use in conventional ventilation. And the constant uh, distending pressure is the mean airway pressure. The tidal volumes are decided by our delta P and our frequency decides how many breaths we're using um, in order to compensate for our smaller tidal volumes. It works best um, in infants with um, heterogeneous lung disease. And those are babies, for example, who have RDS, um, some meconium aspiration babies, pulmonary hypoplasia, but it also works well um, for babies with um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And even though when you look at those x-rays, they, they look heterogeneous, uh, sorry, homogeneous um, lung, uh, uh, lung malformations. Um, in general, we aim for a tidal volume of between one and three mils per kilo. Um, and we have to remember that it's not specifically that tidal volume that's giving us our effect because the dead space of an infant um, and the, this was a term infant study, is around 2.5 to 4 mils per kilo. And so um, we're actually ventilating most often with um, a tidal volume that's lower to the dead space. And I'll explain why this works um, a little bit later when we discuss delta P's and tidal volumes. But in, in, in its simplest form, we tend to use HFOV as prophylaxis um, in, uh, sorry, as, as rescue therapy in the UK. And that's because most of the studies that looked at its prophylactic use have shown that there's no benefit in death or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. When you look at these studies, you have to remember that there may be longer term benefits. Um, Savannah Uchel, um presented their findings in the New England Journal, which suggested that in children who are oscillated at birth, they, they had better lung function. Um, there are some lab studies that have shown that oscillation tends to release fewer interleukins compared to conventional ventilation, um, which might lead to inflammation. And also when most of the oscillation studies were, were done, they were done at, when oscillation was in its infancy in neonatal units. And that means that during these trials is when most people learned how to oscillate. And that might lead to, to results not being as good as they would be where it's done today. Um, but in the same sense, um, volume guarantee ventilation uh, might confer the same benefits as oscillation um, now that we tend to limit tidal volumes to less than seven mils per kilo. So again, what does this mean? Um, well, if we go back to our most important graph again um, and uh, remind ourselves that when we're conventionally ventilating, we're applying this PEEP and the PIP in order to get our tidal volumes. And um, when we're oscillating, um, we apply a mean airway pressure and we use a, a, a delta P or a change in that pressure in order to achieve a, a much smaller tidal volume. Um, and we do that more regularly. So when you look at this on an oscillator um, ventilation curve, it looks um, essentially like a sine wave. And so you have um, a mean airway pressure that's applied to the lungs. And then your um, tidal volumes uh, are generated as, as that pressure oscillates um, about your mean airway pressure. Um, and when um, we go back to those two most important numbers, um, the, the mean airway pressure and the minute ve ventilation, you can see that it's an even simpler relationship in high frequency oscillation because our delta P is what decides our volume of oscillation, which is our minute volume. And we set that mean airway pressure um, at the very beginning. So how do you set up an oscillator? Well, there are many ways to set it up um, in, in truth, um, but this is how I set up, a mean, uh, set up a, an oscillator. Um, and I'm gonna try and explain why, uh, why I do it in this order as well. So the first thing I think about is the mean airway pressure. Um, and I need that mean airway pressure to achieve the alveolar distension and therefore oxygenation. But it's not just about oxygenation. 
And this very important trial at the outset of oscillation very clearly showed that if we um, oscillated lungs on a low volume strategy, we caused damage to those lungs and we also caused infants to have intraventricular hemorrhage. And so what that trial showed us is that we need to aim for a high volume strategy um, and that chest x-rays um, should be used as the major determinant um, of, uh, of lung expansion, not the oxygenation per se. And, and so we can increase the mean airway pressure to improve our oxygenation. But when it comes to weaning, um, we should be looking at our chest x-ray to decide whether our chest is overexpanded um, and wean only if our chest x-ray is over expanded and certainly um, if we do make a change um, we should be doing a chest x-ray to make sure we haven't slipped into a low volume um, low volume strategy and so most people would start with a mean airway pressure of two above what we've achieved with conventional ventilation um, there are calculations that you can use to calculate the mean airway pressure um, i tend to cheat and just read it off the ventilator um, before i switch them over and um, it's very important to do that chest x-ray about an hour after starting so you can check the lung, the lung expansion and um, we know as well that if we over expand the lungs um, then we have an effect on the heart um, and that uh, might cause the blood pressure to fall um, and while sometimes we still require that mean airway pressure you either need to think about reducing it um, in order to improve your cardiac function um, or the use of inotropes to um, help your heart to beat harder if you're needing more airway pressure. The next thing I think about is the frequency. Um, and funnily enough, um, the resonant frequency of the human body is 10 hertz. Um, this guy fairly stuck people on a wobbling board um, and checked to see at what point their body jiggled the most. Um, and it turns out that the resonant frequency is 10 hertz. Um, there is another node at 5 hertz. Um, but then when we look at lungs, um, we find that the resonant frequency of, of premature neonatal lungs is around 10 hertz. Um, but we also have to remember that we're using a mechanical piece of equipment um, and that a piece of equipment has an efficiency. Um, and efficiency tends to drop off below 15 hertz. And so while some studies suggest that infants with RDS have an even higher resonant frequency, um, our ventilators probably aren't able to deliver that effectively. However, um, not all oscillators are equal. And if you have a purpose-built oscillator like the sensor medics, um, you can apply, uh, uh, apply higher frequencies um, more efficiently. So most people would start at a frequency of 10, um, but um, changes to that frequency go beyond um, the simple dynamics of, of, uh, uh, of or the mathematics of, of oscillation. Um, and so you need to talk with someone who knows what they're doing and um, before you make those changes. Um, and the other thing I've just put at the bottom is um, volume guarantee oscillation, which is becoming more and more of a thing. Um, then uh, that has different rules. And, and again, don't make changes unless you understand what's happening. The next thing to think about is your I to E ratio. That's how much of your ventilator cycle is given over to inspiration and how much time is allowed for expiration. Um, for purpose-built oscillators, um, you can tolerate up to 50% because they have a larger component of active expiration. Um, but for standard ventilators um, that are less efficient, um, you might need to cut that down to one in two or 33 to 40%. And then the last thing to think about um, is delta P, and it's these delta P um, changes that um, create oscillation. And when you get the chest, waddle, uh, chest wobble um, that, that everyone talks about with oscillation, what you're actually seeing is, is the creation of vortices within the airways. Um, and it's this that gives us um, gas exchange in neonates, not so much their tidal volumes. So either stand next to the baby and increase the delta P relatively quickly until the chest wobbles, or if you have a ventilator that's not conducive to that, then set the delta P to roughly twice the mean airway pressure. And because we're not guaranteeing the tidal volumes, we need to do a gas at approximately 20 minutes. 20 minutes, incidentally, is, is when um, blood gases reach homeostasis after a ventilator change. And so whatever setting you're on, um, a gas at 20 minutes will tell you roughly where you are. Um, and once the delta P is three times the mean airway pressure, you need to think about frequency more clearly.
So in summary, um, high, uh, high volume strategy is essential for HFOV and we need to use a chest X-ray to check that. Um, and when we are weaning, we need to do regular X-rays to, to make sure that we're not slipping into a low volume strategy. And um, when we change the delta P, we are altering CO2 clearance. And so in HFAV, it's much simpler than conventional ventilation because you can almost independently change your oxygenation and your CO2 clearance. So let's finish off just with um, maybe 10 minutes of um, uh, 10 minutes of some cases. Um, so all of these are real gases, um, and uh, what I'll do is I'll put them up and I'll leave an uncomfortable silence so that you can um, have a look at and, and decide uh, what you think. Um, and then I'll tell you um, what I would do. Um, just remembering in the back of your minds that there are many different ways that you could have um, that you could fix the same problem. Um, and my way, uh, well, yeah, it's always the best, but. Um, uh, I'm happy to take any comments. So this is our first case, which is a 27-weeker, not an uncommon scenario. The PACO2 is nine, and he's on pressure-controlled, non-triggered ventilation, achieving three mils per kilo um, with an oxygen requirement of 0.4. The four surfactant. So here, um, what I would do is um, I would give some surfactant. Um, I would, if, if I couldn't find any surfactant, the person with the keys has gone or um, surfactant has all gone off in the fridge, um, then I might think about increasing the pressure to 20 over five. Um, but my target would be to aim for a tidal volume of around five mils per kilo. And um, what actually happened in this case was um, all of that was done and the baby was given surfactant. And this is the next gas, and I'll give you a little bit longer to try and work out what you might do for this. So, after you've changed your underpants, um, the main aim for, for fixing this, this blood gas is um, that you need those tidal volumes to come down. So you're giving nine mils per kilo because after your surfactant, the compliance has changed hugely. You're giving more pressure and so you're over distending those lungs. So I would be reducing the, the um, pressures by maybe two, sometimes four centimeters of water um, with regular gases until I've brought the, the uh, blood gas back into um into a range um, and also this looks like a fairly good gas so i might start reducing the rate um, in order to let the the baby trigger um, but in the back of my mind i'm also remembering that my baby is not on any sedation um, and so uh, we need to check for synchrony um, as we do that our next case is a term-born baby um, who's had a really difficult start to life and um, about an hour old now um, having been on the unit for half an hour. Um, it's a newborn baby who needed full resus, has um, a very acidotic gas at 6.9 um, with lactates of 23 and a mean arterial blood pressure of 23 as well. Um, he's conventionally ventilated um, on pressure control and achieving tidal volumes of five to six mils per kilo um, and is only in 21% in, in, uh, oxygen. Just having a look at the chat function, um, I think most of you guys are, are heading in the right direction here. Um, yeah, sorry, I haven't included the oxygen saturations. Um, you can assume that they're saturating pretty well and you can derive a lot from the um, arterial PaO2 um, as well. Um, so what I would do with this gas um, is essentially I would leave the ventilation alone um, and I would do all of those things that you guys are, are writing on the chat, which is to give fluid boluses, inotropes. The problem here is not ventilation. Um, the problem is the heart. 
um, is not pumping um, well enough or the baby is hypovolemic for another reason. And so um, you need to um, overcome that in order to improve um, the ventilation. And, and four hours later, um, you've made a lot of those changes, you've given your boluses, you've given inotropes, the mean arterial pressure, uh, blood pressure is, is much better now, it's within the normal range, um, and uh, the ventilation settings have stayed the same, um, but someone's put them on um, targeted tidal volumes of six mils per kilo, um, and this is your guess. So have a look and see what you think, and feel free to chat on the comments if you want to ask. Yeah, so the, the comments are, are, are really good, actually. And, and this is um, one of the things that, um, uh, one of the, a, a good discussion point, actually, is whether to um, aim at reducing the PIP or whether to um, reduce the rate. Um, and in a baby like this, I tend to, first of all, reduce the um, tidal volume of the PIP. And because in the back of my mind, whilst um, my baby has is, is got no respiratory effort at the moment, the normal history of these babies is that they start to wake up a bit. Um, and so um, when I'm reducing the rate down, I'm always thinking about synchronicity. Um, and so you might consider reducing the rate here. And um, because while the, uh, uh, sorry, the other point being that whilst this is an acidotic gas um, and changing these settings will make your baby more acidotic, um, it's not, you're not acidotic because of the, the CO2, you're acidotic again um, because of the metabolic and, and the perfusion issues, um, which need to be dealt with separately. Um, and so I, I would tend to reduce the, the tidal volumes or the pips, and I'd think about reducing the rate. Um, but if I was going to do that, I'd make sure my baby was um, sedated appropriately so that if he did start to wake up, he wasn't going to fight what I'm doing. So this is case number three, um, a 27-weeker um, who's uh, now nine weeks old. Um, who's septic and has been re-intubated, having been extubated for, for some time, and because of his sepsis. He's got a pH of 7.4, um, a CO2 of 9, and the baby looks mottled. Uh, these are arterial gases. Okay, so some really good suggestions coming in here. Um, so the, the main thing to look at in this gas is, is there a problem, first of all? Um, and whilst the PaCO2 is 9, which is high, this is likely um, to, to be um, due to uh, the fact that this is an, a bronchopulmonary plasia child who's got a long history of respiratory insufficiency and uh, rotten lungs. And the CO2 of 9, given that he's got a base excess that's well corrected and a pH that's well corrected, this is likely to be a long standing CO2 for this baby. And so in all honesty, this is probably a relatively normal gas um, for a baby who's X27 weeks, who's nine weeks old. And so um, to my mind, I, I would leave this baby alone um, from a ventilation point of view. Um, but I, I would certainly do some of the things that are being suggested on the chat, which is um, make sure that the blood pressure is OK. That would be the key measurement um, to, to measure. Make sure that the lactate um, is OK as well, because that's likely to be high. And then manage blood pressure and CO2. And um, one of the concerning things is, is that the oxygenation is poor. Um, we're in 100 percent oxygen and uh, we are we are struggling a little bit. And so something does need to be done 
Um, but uh, what you might do here is do a chest X-ray to see why your FiO2 is so high, um, or uh, change the mode of ventilation to high frequency oscillation um, in order um, to achieve a better mean airway pressure and oxygenation. But in a baby that collapses and is septic, um, I would want more information before I ramped up high pressures. Now, what actually happened in this case was that um, someone looked at the CO2 of nine um, and increased the tidal volumes um, up to eight mils per kilo um, as a result. Um, and um, the resulting gas um, an hour later was this. <laughs> oh dear indeed oh dear indeed um, and exactly right um, to, to Sarah there um, this baby uh, the reason for his collapse whilst he was septic um, one, during the intubation likely um, he has developed a pneumothorax this obviously isn't his x-ray um, but it's just to remind you that the, um, the numbers that you're seeing on this gas have um, a baby attached to them and Ultimately, you must make sure that you know why your baby is as sick as they are. And a chest X-ray is and an, and an examination are very, very important in, in deciding those things. Because no matter what settings you use here, um, you are not going to make anything better until you pull that um, extra pleural air out of the chest cavity and reinflate that lung. OK, let's go um, uh, to case number four. Um, I think we'll, we'll just have time to do this one um, and then you can have a, a look at the, the last case online. So in, um, in its simplest form, this is an acidotic baby with poor oxygenation, poor CO2 clearance. Yes, you do want to do a chest X-ray to make sure you haven't got a pneumothorax, um, but in this case, the chest X-ray was normal. Um, and this baby had PROM, but the PROM was for four weeks um, prior to um, delivery. So this is a hypoplastic baby. Um, you might well consider a second dose of surfactant. In fact, we did that in this baby. Um, but it, he didn't um, respond to that at all. Um, and so what we did was um, exactly what Bowler said, which is start high frequency oscillation. Um, we aimed for a mean airway pressure two above the mean airway pressure we were achieving on conventional ventilation, the settings as we've discussed um, before, and uh, we would want to do an early gas uh, with an early chest X-ray as well. So I'm going to end there. There's another case that you can have a quick look at online as well. Um, but just in summary, um, ventilation can be incredibly complex um, and also involve uh, other, uh, one would argue, lesser important organs of the body like the heart and, and brains and things like that. Um, but there's also some very simple principles that can help you to decide what to do and, and when to do it as well. And um, you should never be afraid to ask for help. Um, if you're stuck or if you're thinking about two different uh, possibilities. Um, gases are your friend, but the baby at the end of your ventilator is the most important thing that we're looking after. Um, and whilst um, I'm trying to give you the science behind what I would do, um, there is safety in doing what you know, and this leads to variations between units. And just because the science might suggest that there's a small gain doing one thing, it might be outweighed by the benefit of staying as you are and, and, and not uh, uh, changing things and, and all the training problems that that might lead to. So um, there's a few minutes left, uh, in fact, probably not many minutes at all. Um, I'm very happy to answer questions that come through the chat. Um, or you can email me um, and uh, I will try and get back to you um, if you have any further questions. Thank you very much for listening.
just a, a quick talk, uh, a quick question that's come through is why use SIMV rather than SIPPV or, or PTV in term babies? Um, well, um, SIMV is very easy because uh, if you want to reduce the minute volume, you cut down the rate um, and the, the breaths aren't supported even if the baby's breathing away. Um, I tend to use PTV even for term babies, but often um, the term baby pathology is, is such that their respiratory centre is affected and they tend to either pant um, or have a much higher respiratory rate um, as a result. And so um, PTV isn't always the best mode. And sometimes you need a halfway house between heavily sedating and paralysing a term baby in order to reduce their respiratory rate and also maybe offering a little bit less support with, with a mode like SIMV. You're most welcome guys. Take care, have a lovely day. Um, sorry, just one other question is, is there a way to give maximum pressure in volume control? Um, only by increasing the tidal volume. So the more you increase the tidal volume, the more likely you are to, um, to deliver the maximum pressure that you set. Excellent. Thanks a lot, guys. Hisham, why don't you uh, contact me um, by email and then I can try and put this down in email for you. Is that okay?